thanks to Christoph and Pat for inviting me to speak. I'd just like to tell you that I'm actually speaking on behalf of an international research group and thankfully it's being filmed. So there's, um, there's two universities in Scotland who will be watching this, Harriet Watt and the University of Edinburgh, and four universities in Colombia, and we're connected online. I'll discuss that later. Um, but this small round table will actually probably have a much larger impact than is immediately visible. So the project I'm going to um, talk about is called Managing Urban Innovation. Um, it was a project that we've shortened to a little acronym called MUI for social media reasons. MUI in Spanish means very, but you would spell it M-U-Y. Um, but it's something that worked in both Spanish and English. And what I'd like to do is, very briefly, I'm going to give you a bit of context about Medellin because I don't want to take it for granted that you understand where we're coming from. It's actually a very complex city, um, social, politically and economically. And I'm going to tell you a little, about, a little bit about innovation, which is the basis of this project, and the themes that innovation brings out then the method with which we're de delivering or, or working on this project, the proposal and the discussion. And I'll try and keep it very brief. Interrupt me if you want. Um, so Medellin is in Colombia. Colombia is the northwestern country in South America. It has Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. And it's actually where the Andes range comes up from South America and diverges into three different Andes mountains. So Medellin is inside what's called the Abra Valley, and it's very, very lush and fertile. This is a picture I took when I was arriving in August. And landing into this incredibly urban city is quite an experience because you just fly over valleys and valleys, and it's very green and fertile. And uh, in between the, the actual mountain range, it, the city has developed along a crevice. And this crevice has a long river running through it, and so the city has developed out of that river. But if you cut a section through Medellin, it's actually a two very big Andes mountains, and then the city is at the bottom, um, sort of sprawling upwards, not outwards, as we know in London. Um, it's really, really difficult to even think about talking about Medellin without giving you a bit of context about its past and its violent um, history. It's a it's a historical condition in Colombia that there's been a local civil war since the early 18th century. But Medellin particularly, because it was home to the Medellin cartel, has at one point in 1991 reached 90,000 deaths per year, which is a really staggering figure. I mean, I don't know if, um, if, you, if you try and compare that that works out at 17 deaths per day. And if you really try and compare that to something that we can relate to nowadays, um, in the highest, most violent year of Medellin, which was 1991, there were 6,439 murders, homicide murders in the city. And in the highest peak in Baghdad, which was in 2007, there was 3,800. So this is really staggering. Um, that has an impact in the city. It means that it means that the city was um, it was very silent at night. There were no policemen. People were petrified. They would stay in the streets. They would stay in the homes. The streets were quite dark. There was all sorts of gang activity that was basically ruling illicitly and taking over the cities. And that has a sort of impact at all sorts of levels. It has an impact on the economy, on the social networks, on the ties. Um, sorry, so that's the figure from Baghdad. And a small social revolution or movement began to occur in the, after Pablo Escobar was killed, the early 2000, late 1990s, where people really wanted to say no more to violence, no more to the drug war, um, all the paramilitary groups that had opened up to try and fight the guerrillas were being expelled or they wanted them to be expelled from the city. And this was quite common to see young people in the streets, you know, actively trying to, to have a better life in Medellin. But um, 
there is a structural root of the problem, of this urban problem, which is an incredibly large social inequality across Latin America in general, but Colombia is no different, and this violence has probably exasperated the social inequality. Um, to an extent that in Colombia, when we talk about neighborhoods and when we talk about urban areas, we refer to them as, as stratas, and we classify the way that the UK has a, a borrow system of vans around the home. In Colombia, you, you classify this a lot around income households. So strata one is very the lowest low-income household, and that's the, the red areas, which are really um, illegal settlements, forest developments, they're on occupied land, and then strata six is the upper class uh, earning above the minimum wage. But you can see that there's a huge problem in, in terms of social inequality. So what happened in, in the early 2000s was um, that Medellin had a series of new planning approaches. Because it had been, because it's a city that has been sort of isolated from the rest of the country, it had a very entrepreneurial spirit from the very beginning, and there were a lot of localized <coughs> policies that weren't necessarily reflected across the country. And they have been very innovative in developing these at a micro level in Medellin. Um, a few examples of these is social urbanism, which is a sort of buzzword that has emerged on an international level and by which we keep using Medellin as an example of, um, of what the city has been doing right. And some people just refer to it as the miracle of Medellin. Then there's other types of policies, such as the way the city de has developed through POTs, which is a very localized and collaborative approach to policy making and master plan building. So it's not a top-down approach, but it's getting small communities, whether they're informal uh, communities, to build their own master plan, to find their own projects, to decide what public spaces they need. And that's built into what's called the POT. And there's other types of planning approaches. So integrated urban projects, um, macro projects, which is about financing large schemes, not necessarily through the state only. And all of this has become collectively known as social urbanism, but social urbanism is a little bit more complex than that. Social urbanism is really the time when there, the eight years when there was a mayor in Medellin who said, actually the way that we can turn the city around is by building state-of-the-art libraries in the most run-down areas of the city. We want people that have never had access to education, to proper housing, to proper infrastructure, to say, I deserve to go into a good public space, I deserve to have a library, and look, the state is coming to me and building it. And this mayor um, operated throughout the eight years and has turned this ideology into what's called social urbanism. It's about bringing amazing infrastructure and facilities to parts of the city that have historically been neglected. But it's a bit misleading as well because social urbanism might be the climax of, of a long series of policies that have been developing because of this um, specific sort of island condition in Medellin. Nevertheless, let's just assume we understand social urbanism is the highlight. Um, the Urban Land Institute, together with Wall Street Journal, have this yearly award for the city of the year, and Medellin won this award in 2013 for the most innovative city. Um, and it was quite renowned at the time because it beats Tel Aviv and New York City. So for the first time, the Colombian discourse is really at an international level, and Medellin was being compared to cities such as these two. It was... Um, it was justified because of all of these policies and the way that, through urbanism, the city had been turned around. Um, Medellin's homicide rate had plunged from 80% from 1991, which was that highest, the peak year, to 2010. And as a consequence of those projects, the public libraries, the parks, the schools, um, the transport infrastructure had started to take place and it was built and it began, an urban renaissance began in the city. 
which is what the Urban Land Institute was trying to promote. And I'm just going to show you a bit of examples of these projects. So um, this is a Biblioteca Belen by a Japanese architect. And it's an open space that has an open courtyard. It's in a marginal area that um, had converted this previous warehouse where no one really used to go into four different quarters. When I went there, there was a really touching scene of some small kids having a violin lesson on <coughs> shared borrowed violins from the library from a professional <coughs> musician from the city. And those are scenes that we might be used to, but they're not customary scenes in Colombia. People from low income, uh, from low income households really don't have access to this type of facilities. This is a very large public library that was built on an area which is almost a landfill site, lands, uh, with problems of landslide. And it has been a very large informal settlement that built around it. And they've put the library at the top of the hill. Um, it's called Biblioteca España. And it's become an incredibly popular library. They, they pioneered bringing the a uh, ski lift cable into as part of the oyster system of transport. So they've integrated what was the metro running along the river with this metro cable, which runs up to the hills. And what it does is it, it provides the transports and the infrastructure for people to be able to access um, the grid of Medellin, which had previously been inaccessible. So that's, that's one of the... Um, big debates uh, at an international level of how through public infrastructure you can increase social mobility. Uh, this is another project which is a house for the memory for the violent past. It's a museum. Um, these are new housing projects that are being built and they're being built under these innovative planning schemes which are sort of localised master planning. Um, that, that they raise issues as well because they're being built on the peripheries and they're high-rise developments. Um, I've got, I'm just going to take you to one part of these neighbourhoods so that you can see what it's like to visit just one quarter of Medellin. So this is as you walk out of the metro cable. And as you, uh, when you finish making that sort of crossing the river over that walkway, you arrive at this residential neighbourhood, which is phenomenal because this is an informal development that over time has has grown and has formalised itself and um, become, you know, there's infrastructure now, there's roads, there's sewage. But the reason uh, this is an interesting project is because instead of instead of trying to formalise people by moving them out, fixing the roads and then moving them back in. What the government did or the local uh, council did is that they retrofitted all of this infrastructure. So they parcelised the land and moved people slowly, built the sewage, built the roads and didn't actually disrupt their existing social ties and network, which is absolutely fundamental to the way that these illegal communities operate and work. Um, so that's being used as or hailed as an example that they want to replicate throughout the city. And so looking at innovation, or looking at Medellin under the light of innovation, four different themes come out, which is the area of study that we're, we're starting to um, investigate. One is issues around housing and habitat, and that's the research question for housing and habitat. Um, the other is issues around public realm, green infrastructure and well-being. So to what extent have the provisions of public space, from the perspective of its creation, management and perception, contributed to socio-economic and environmental integration in Medellin? There's a slight concern 
that by having infrastructure retrofitted into areas that have notorious ecological problems and environmental problems like landslides, what you're actually telling people is, well, actually it's fine to keep building here and undo years of work where the government has been saying, well, you can't build on the edge of the mountains because it's very dangerous. And then what type of public space is actually being created when you start retrofitting infrastructure, when you go to public space and you try and fix it after it's already established itself. Um, there's a theme around heritage and cultural value, uh, value, sorry. So to what extent has the innovative city planning approach and the new emerging creative practices included public participation and collaboration in the definition of cultural values and the shared spaces in Medellin. Oh, something happened with these images. And um, mobility and social spatial integration. So what's the impact of the innovation and mobility, both on quality of life and on social equity? There's a, uh, there's a really important question, which is, has the Metro Cable actually helped reduce the social inequality? Or is it a sort of Medellin tourism platform? Um, how many people have actually had their commute shortened and an improve in their quality of life and these are these are projects that are being undertaken right now to try and, and understand what the impact of all these innovative policies have been on social inequality so the context after looking at these four themes um, with which we've set up this project is that the there's definitely <coughs> been a creation of a good transport infrastructure there's been cultural and regeneration. There's a strong support of local development from business sector, and the private companies have historically operated very successfully in Medellin in collaboration with the state. This isn't a, it's not a neoliberal approach, but it's not a state-led planning approach either. It's really a collaboration. However, having visited Medellin and started this project, there's some issues that need to be addressed. So is the city spreading by bringing infrastructure out? Uh, and should it be densified around the river? You can see from the video I showed you that a lot of the city look, turns its back towards the river, which is a central axis. Um, so is the city spreading as a compact model? Um, what is the intervention in informal areas and in vulnerable informal areas? Is the formal and informal development looking at the topography around Medellin? Is it taking it into account? Is the public space accessible and built of good quality? Um, and is it accessible to everyone? Is it, is it accessible for, a, a, for young people and for older people with, with maybe mobility issues? So this, what this has led to is a project that is um, trying to look at those four themes and address all of those questions as part of a large international research team. And through a British Council funding scheme that's called the Newton Caldas Fund, th we, we are working on a knowledge exchange partnership between academic universities in Colombia and academic universities in the UK to try and address these four themes. And it's going to look at the key elements of Medellin, its past, its political approach, its planning approach. It will look at those four themes that I just showed you before. Um, and as a very large team and collaborative experience, we've allocated a leader for the Colombian Academic University and for the UK Academic University so that each theme has two different leaders, two different um, contexts or historical backgrounds that will develop the theme and build small scoping studies to put forward. So this is a sort of a harnessing project where we look at urban innovation as a, as a whole and it could become the catalyst for four much larger research projects each under a theme. So this is the, the, this is the team that we're working with. These are the Colombian universities and some private sector groups. Um, and the UK University 
I'm currently working with the University of Edinburgh as the researcher on the project. Everyone else is an academic that is working on the project through their academic work. Um, and our overall aim is going to be to identify means of making Medellin a more socially equitable, equitable and environmentally sustainable city, to learn lessons, draw them from Medellin and be able to apply them elsewhere. So those are the... And the, the proposal has two different um, <coughs> components. So one is the research program, which is basically to look at these four themes to develop scoping studies around each theme. And um, that's going to lead to different work packages and an academic paper per theme. So in the UK and in European academia, it's very important that all the deliverables can be written out in an academic journal. In Colombia, academia is slightly different, whereas everyone publishes small books. They're quite hard to find, so when you start working, it's very it's difficult to find this information, but they publish small books and, and we'll be doing that within Colombia and then the four papers here. Um, and then the second component is really about knowledge exchange. So it's about working together and trying to find a common ground, a platform for exchanging ideas and exchanging methodology um, between ver two very different contexts and two very different universities or groups of universities. It's a two-year project. We started in June. Uh, we did one workshop for a week in August where everyone went to Medellin. We met, we did a lot of site visits and we discussed the four themes, one day per theme, and set up a research question around each theme. And then there's going to be two intensive research trips. So one is coming up in March where we'll just look at two themes and that's the workshop um, where it says theme one and theme three and we'll repeat that in August. And the idea is that we spend a week per theme doing site visits, round table discussions, um, gathering data, working with students, um, working at the, in local governments, and trying to collect as much information to unpack these research questions. And then in April, so in a year's time, we'll have a concluding workshop once we've done the four different workshops. Um, so what we've done so far is that the, the first thing we did was we just <coughs> set up a, a social media strategy because it, was in, it is incredibly difficult. I'm the researcher based in London, the universities are in Scotland and there's four universities in Colombia and Colombia has one of the highest rates of Twitter usage in Twitter sphere. So we wanted to kind of use Twitter as a way of accessing the public, um, which is why we needed to find the acronym and a hashtag that we could start using everywhere. And we've set up a website uh, where we have, we're trying to keep track of all of the different events that are happening, but also bring together all the resources that we find, these little books that I was telling you about, which are quite hard to find, we'll find them and we'll upload them there, papers, abstracts, everything becomes open source and this becomes a sort of a website of urban innovation. And tied to that website is an Instagram account, a LinkedIn, a Facebook account. Um, and these are mainly active when we do the trips to Medellin. We're recording things and we're uploading them. And um, within Twitter, it's already had quite good um, feedback system because people start, anything that has to do with Colombia, Colombians will just grab and start sharing. And so the next step really right now is to start focusing on these two themes which is housing and habitat and the heritage and cultural values which we'll go and, and do in March. I'll go out there for a week beforehand, gather a lot of data and organize the workshops and then we'll have two weeks where all the academics and a lot of um, guests come in and we discuss and we have our activities. And I think the, that's pretty much it. The, the last time I went back to <coughs> Medellin before August had been in, 19, in 2003. So I'm from Colombia, but I'm not from Medellin. I always saw it as I'm from the capital. 
And I went to the local cemetery, which is a really beautiful monument, and you go there because it's just a beautiful old cemetery with lots of small mausoleums. But I remember that it's also quite notorious because it's where the young hitmen are all buried. And it was really shocking at the time to make that trip and to see that at least 80 or 90 percent of all the mausoleums were of young boys that were between the age of 16 and 20. And if you go there, you see that it's full of young boys and they're, and they're visiting their friends or their gang members. And that's the image that I had from Medellin, and that's a quite, it sounds like a cliche image abroad, but it's quite a common image in Medellin that hits men boys have ruined the streets. And I think um, part of this project is trying to unpack of whether or not that's really going to change or it's starting to disappear. And that image of going to the library and seeing the young boys playing a violin and having access to a different type of education and a different type of urban life that we've had access to was very shocking as well because that's kind of the first glimpses of uh, maybe a hope for the people of Medellin or it could just be something that's very much on the surface. So for me personally, that's really what I'm trying to unpack in this project. Thank you. Thank you.